Well, Lisa Franz just said, great job, praise team, and we do appreciate you guys and all that you do. How is the volume if you're watching online? Would you let me know? Uh, uh, just send me a little note on here. By the way, our last song was our offertory. Uh, it's a little awkward online to do offering. Uh, so we've also got a link. There's a link on our uh, uh, page. You can go to surfsidecommunity.com or thesurfsidefellowship.com. Don't go to Surfside Community. You'll be giving to another church. I mean, you can. But <laughs> anyway, but uh, uh, let's see. Does somebody say it sounds good? Good volume. All right, Laura, thank you for the input there. So I don't know. Today we're going to talk about when life is the pits. And we are looking at a series that I did seven years ago when the world was very different. But the principles of Scripture are always the same. Now, a few weeks ago, my son went out on my kayak. I have a, a kayak and we go out on the lake. And I always encourage my kids, and I try to uh, uh, at least have the life vest close. If they're younger, they need to wear the life vest. But then we also have something called a dry bag. If you've never seen one of these, basically you put what's important to you. And this is Florida. So I've got sunscreen and uh, sunscreen. And I had some bug repellent. In here, but apparently somebody took it out. So I have three things of sunscreen. Apparently that's all that's important. But anyway, you take your wallet or you take maybe a dry towel and you put it in this bag and then you roll it over. And then if you flip the boat, which, you know, never happens, of course. If you flip the kayak and you end up in the water, your stuff ends up dry. It even has a zipper pocket. This is where I usually put my phone. I slide it in here. Now, if you don't zip it up all the way, you're in big trouble. But a few weeks ago, my son was out on the lake with a buddy. And they were fishing, and he went, uh, felt like he had a fish. And when he went to pull, he flipped his boat over, and everything went out of the boat. And, of course, you never plan that. You don't go out on the lake thinking, I plan on flipping this boat today, but it happens. And how many of you in here, Queen, everybody, uh, David, all the people that are looking at me, The Rock, I'm glad you're here again. You know, it's good that The Rock's coming to church every week lately. I, I heard he's even sitting in here during the week and praying, so that's good. But uh, uh, how many of you have been in a boat and been flipped out of a boat? Go ahead and raise your hands right where you're at. All right, it's good to see you, you guys don't have arms, but, but I'm just believing at home that you're, you're raising your hand, that you've been flipped out of a boat. Good morning, Sheila. Anyway, so let me ask you a question. So when you have, get flipped out of a boat and you've got a dry bag, you're ready. Now, let me tell you something, though. Life is still not the same. When you get flipped out of a boat, it's a big change. And even if your stuff's in a dry bag, it is not something you want to do. Nobody goes out on the lake and goes, man, I hope I get flipped out. Now, there's one exception to that. If you're on one of those tubes and you're dragging children, your hope as the boat driver is that you can flip those children into the water. But other than that, typically you don't want to end up in the water. And those kids are like, my daughter loves it when we take her out on the tube. She's like, please flip the tube. Get me in the water and, of course, I never can. But very rarely in life do you want to be flipped out of a boat. And yet it happens. And if you're a Floridian, you've probably ended up in the water by accident at least once, especially if you were in a kayak or a canoe or, or something smaller. Or if you're one of those people like one of my friends who was getting in their boat and the boat separated from the dock and they ended up in the water. Now, here's the thing about life. When we look at life, there's some truth about the pits in life. There's some things we're going to look at today, some truths that happen, because you're going to go through a pit. A lot of you, listen, there's a lot of people struggling right now. There's a lot of people been laid off from work. A lot of people who have lost their jobs. There are people who have lost loved ones. Others who have family members and, and friends who have COVID, which, which I do. I've had uh, uh, several friends, a good pastor friend of mine here, uh, that, that had he and his wife both had COVID. They are recovering, thankfully. But people who are struggling in all kinds of ways. And there are truths that are true no matter what your pit is. Whether it has something to do with this situation or another situation, there's going to be some truths. And so let me, let me tell you this. Let me ask you this. Are you and I, when life gets in a pit, are we going to be able to let go and trust God? Are we going to be able to let go of our hurts and our frustration? Are we going to be able to let go of maybe your pit in life is somebody who hurt you? 
Are you going to be able to let go of that person? Forgive the person who hurt you. We're going to look at Joseph today. Look at the person that hurt you. That loss you've experienced. Maybe suddenly you had a loss. Everything seemed to be going great. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Maybe for you, it was an unfair situation. Maybe you were put in a difficulty. I know people who've had things happen to them. And they're able to say, it really wasn't my fault. It's because of this happening. Then this, And we have to learn, can we let go of that? How about this? How about that dumb thing you did? I had a friend from high school this week call me. And one of the funniest things, I'm 50-something years old. I've been out of high school a long time. But let me tell you what's interesting. Is old feelings and old regrets pop up. When you remember old times, all of a sudden, after I got off the phone with them this week, they were doing a podcast. And when I got off the phone with them, I remember some of the things that I did, the dumb things. And I thought, I wish I hadn't done that. Can we let go of those things? So here's what I want you to know. We're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at how life changes suddenly. God is with you and he can work all things for the good. Now, let me give you what John uh, uh, from Max Licato says in the, his book. And I love this. I'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. I won't be foolish or naive, but nor will I despair. With God's help, I know I will get through this. You know, in life, you don't have a lot of choices. You can be bitter or you can be better. So let's first of all talk about how the pit happens suddenly. The pit happens suddenly. And all of a sudden, my computer, let's see if I can get it to undo. It decided, I wish you could see it, it decided to be gigantic, and I have no idea why. I've never had that happen before. That was brand new. Okay, we're back. All right. So this last week, you know, things happened suddenly. This last Sunday, I was replacing a neighbor's mailbox. Can I tell you that my plan was not to replace a neighbor's mailbox? But one of my children decided that texting was more important than driving. Can I tell you that things can change quickly, sometimes because of choices of other people and sometimes because of our choices, but here's the truth. Things in life, the pit happens suddenly. So let's pick up the story from Genesis 37 and talking about Joseph. By the way, this is about half of the book of Genesis. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. And many of us call this the coat of many colors, right? Or the technicolor dream coat, maybe your preference. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So think about this. Everything is going well. Everything goes even better. The dad says, oh man, I think you're so awesome. I'm going to give you this expensive ornament. By the way, clothes did not come easy back then. You didn't just go down to the local Target or Walmart and get clothes. And so his dad gave him this amazing robe. And so he's thinking, oh, this is great. And then it says his brothers hated him and could no longer speak a kind word to him. I don't know if you've ever been around a person that does not like you. But if you get around a person who can no longer say a kind word to you, you don't want to be around them. So imagine now Joseph's life with 10 other brothers, the brothers from another mother. And yet they wouldn't say anything nice to him day after day. Everything changed in a moment. And then it changes even more in verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. What did they do? The first thing they did was to, they were jealous of him. So they took away the one thing that they were jealous of. But then it continues the ornate robe he was wearing and they took him. And they threw him in a cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. Now you have to realize this was a big hole in the desert. Now I don't know if you have ever in the summer gotten into a place where there is no breeze. Years ago when I was a kid, I worked for a farmer who raised plants and I was the new guy, so I was in charge of taking the little plants and putting them all the way in the front of a semi-truck. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a semi-truck during the summer, but it is hot. And so I would go in there, and it was just a few minutes, and I felt like I was going to die. I can't imagine 
how Joseph felt thrown in this cistern in a desert. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up so the brothers could care less, so much so that they sat down to eat. I mean, they're drinking beverages, they're eating, and their brother's crying out. We know later, from later in the story, that he was crying out for them. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balms, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, hey, what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, I got an idea. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. And then I love this. He justifies it. Not only is he doing something evil, he thinks it's good. He says, after all, after all, he is our brother, our own flesh. Like suddenly he's compassionate. Oh, we we're not going to kill him. We're just going to sell him. I mean, that's, we're, we're so generous. By the way, his brothers, there's other stories about them. They show what doofuses they are. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianites merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and they sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. His older brother said, hey, what have you done? The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. Now let me tell you something about the pit. Oftentimes the pit doesn't just affect you. Even there are times when you go through an area of darkness, a time of darkness, a time of trial, a time of struggle in your life that you're, you feel like you're thrown in the pit. But if you will pay attention, oftentimes there's other people around you that are hurting too. Joseph's father now was hurting too. And can you imagine the brothers after they did this going and partying and saying, hey, we've gotten away with it. Dad believes our brother is dead. In Jeremiah 38, Jeremiah is thrown in a cistern. It's the same idea. He thinks he's going to die. He doesn't know what's going to happen. It's not uncommon. You know, a lot of times we listen to the Bible. We listen to a TV preacher and they make it sound like everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about this. You know, the next time we see Joseph, it's over 20 years later. 20 years of struggle. 20 years of frustration. Let me give you the first prayer. Father... Give me peace when life changes. You notice it doesn't say if life changes. Jesus in another place in scripture said, uh, uh, you will have trouble. He says, in this world, you will. He doesn't say in this world, you could. He doesn't say in this world, you might. In this world, possibly if you don't behave yourself. No, no. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Life changes quickly. Number two, so not only does the pit happen suddenly. Number two, God is is with us in the pit. Now, when Joseph was thrown in the pit, he was 17 years of age. He would not see his brothers again till he was 37 years of age. I just want to show you what 17 looks like. Here's a picture of me at 17 years of age. That's me and my friend David Postmas, who was a bass player. And we were in my convertible. I got to show you my convertible with my brother. We were joking around like he was pushing my convertible. This is my convertible Mustang. We bought it for $800. Put a new dash in it. Ran great for years. Here's the thing. 17 years of age. I don't know about you, but between 17 and almost 40 years of age, my life was very different. Joseph was gone that whole time. Imagine what he went through. And here's the deal. Joseph had options here. Joseph had options about what he was going to do next. And, and here's the thing. Was Joseph going to be bitter the whole time when he was thrown in prison? Was, what was Joseph going to think about? Was he going to focus on his brothers? And I believe that Joseph forgave his brothers. Do you know why I think that? Because when his brothers showed up, he was ready to deal with them. And if he had been bitter, he would have immediately wiped them out. By the time Joseph sees his brothers again, 
22 years or so later, he is now, it's, it's called a visor. He, visor. he was the one in charge of Egypt, and he was the one who, when people came and wanted to get goods, he would examine each of them to make sure they weren't there to challenge Egypt or to go after the Pharisees, that, Pharisees the Pharaoh. That was one of his jobs, not the Pharisees. They weren't there yet. That, wasn't, that was a few years later. But anyway, but he was there. That was part of his job. So him bringing his brothers in and questioning them was not rare. He did that to other people too. And I can tell you right now, he had full authority. He could have executed them at any time. So we're going to go back to the story later next week, but I want to read near the end of the story to show you how that God is with you in the pit. Because listen to what Joseph says in verse three of chapter 45, many chapters later, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. His brothers were not able to answer him. Why? Because they were terrified at his presence. So Joseph, this comes later in the story. Joseph's brothers come to get food. They go back. They come back again. And this time Joseph decides to tell him, hey, I'm your brother. Now you can imagine what that was like for brothers who all these years felt guilty. We find that out in between. And we'll talk about this in the next few weeks. Joseph said to his brother, they weren't able to answer him because they were terrified. Do you blame them? Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me, which that's probably the last place you would want to go if you thought your brother wanted to kill you. And they said, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one that sold you into Egypt. Now time out. Remember, Joseph would have shaved his head. Egyptians did that. He would have been wearing full Egyptian makeup. He would have been tan. He would have been in shape. He would have had all kind of people around him. He would have been wearing that huge headdress. He would have most likely been sitting on a gold throne, surrounded by wealth and power. He could have snapped his fingers and done anything. But listen to what he says here. I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? His brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And at that point, they had to be like, yeah, that's, you had to remind us of that. I think we knew that. And now, listen to this. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives. Now listen to what Joseph says about life. That God sent me ahead of you. You know, whatever you're going through, I'm not saying that God was the one that forced that to happen or God's not the one who made somebody hurt you, but God can use that hurt. For two years, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five, there'll be no plowing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you. Basically, God used your dumb action so that I could do, listen to what he says next, to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. So Joseph's looking at his brothers and saying, basically, I'm in charge of everything. You think you sent me here, but God had a purpose even in the hurt. Have you been hurt by somebody? Has somebody hurt you during your life? Have you been betrayed? Is there somebody that you need to forgive? Now, here's what I want you to know. That thing that happened to you, Joseph never says, I think it's great that you guys wanted to kill me. I think it's great that you deceived our, my dad and mom. I think it's great that you threw me in the pit. I think, no, no. He said, even though, and a little bit later, even though you did this, God used it. Why? Because God was with him. I believe that when Joseph was in jail, he knew God was with him. And I believe when Joseph was in the palace, he knew God was with him. And when Joseph, even in Egypt, was again accused falsely, instead of becoming bitter, once again, he trusted God. And as he learned to trust God, guess what? God continued to bless him. Can you trust God? Can you, can you be aware of God's presence even when things don't go the way you want them to? Can you be aware of God's presence in the frustrations and the downturns of life? In Isaiah 43, people quote this verse all the time. It says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. By the way, that's a reminder of what happened in Egypt. 
When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Now you have to realize when Isaiah wrote this, what was going on? The people were in captivity in Babylon. They were (laughs) in Iran or Iraq. They were taken captive. They were prisoners. They were out of their own country, pulled apart, being forced to do all kinds of things they didn't want to do. And yet Isaiah reminds them, even in the middle of all these things, it might be hot. You might have to swim. But God is with you. Are you going through a time where life is hot? Are you going through a time where you're having to swim and life's been easy and now you're out of the boat and you're just hanging on and you only got a few things left and you're hoping they stay dry and you're just hanging on? Listen, God is with you even in the pain and the suffering and the sorrow. Here's your next prayer. Father, help me to know your presence in the pit. Here's what I know about God's presence. That regardless of what you're going through, Whether you're going through a hospital stay or something a doctor told you or something your boss just told you or something that's happening at home or a situation with a family member or some resentment or some bitterness or some frustration or you've been accused falsely or you've been thrown in a pit, you've probably not had that happen. But just about everything else that happened to Joseph has happened to most of us. God, help me to know your presence. If you will know his presence in the middle of that, you know what he'll do? He'll walk you through what it is. Now, you're going to go through times of resentment. You're going to be mad at people who hurt you. But if you receive God's presence, and you're going to learn how to forgive. By the way, forgiveness is not a one-time thing. So when you go through this forgiveness, you have to choose. I'm going to forgive again when I remember this moment, when I remember this thing happened. I'm sure Joseph woke up some nights with nightmares of being in that hot pit, thinking he was going to die right there, and then being dragged out to a country as he begged his brothers, as he was taken off in chains. I'm sure some nights he woke up maybe angry, Maybe a little PTSD. He was totally freaked out. And yet he knew God was with him. So what happened? God, would you walk me through this thing? What's the latest thing in your life you have to walk through? Receive God's presence. Know that he'll walk you through it. Lean on him as you walk through those things. So the pit happened suddenly. God is with us in the pit. And then finally, number three. God can use the pit for our good. God can use whatever pit you're in right now, whatever pit you're going through, whatever. Now, please listen, don't do this. Don't take this sermon and call that friend who's having a hard time and say, listen, you need number three. You know, God can use this for your good. And don't just quote them a verse about how God can use it. You know what the most important thing you can do for somebody who's in a pit? Look for a way to help them and look for a way to be with them. It's not for you to stand over the pit and go, you know, you wouldn't be in the pit if you'd been a little less arrogant with your brothers. You know, you know, you, you really, you, I wish you were up here with me. I've got air conditioning up here, right? And a lot of times what we do is we just counsel people that are in the pit when what we need to do sometimes is climb into the pit with them. Especially, listen, if you can help somebody out of the pit, that's great. But sometimes you can't. All you can do is be with them. All you can do is tell them you love them and let them ask God to be with them through their trial and their struggle. About eight years ago, I was in the hospital for 30 days. And for the next two years, I was in the hospital a total of about 60 days. Now, let me tell you something. I did not want to do that. I still struggle sometimes because of all the surgeries that I had. But let me tell you the good that came out of that. When I go to visit somebody in the hospital and they've been in a week, or they've been in two weeks, or they've been in three weeks, and they say to me, oh, I hate this. I can look at them and go, I know, I remember. I know, I struggle with that too. And sometimes I can say to them, you know what I did when I was on week four, and I was tired of being in the bed, and the bed was hot, and they wanted me to get up and walk, and I didn't feel like walking, and I was carrying around two things full of IVs, one on each arm to walk around the hospital. I'd say, you know what I did? One of the things I did is I asked for two robes. And I'd put one on my back and they started calling me Superman at the hospital. 
But that way I didn't, didn't, there were things that I learned as I was in the hospital, ways I learned to cope with being in the hospital, ways I learned to be thankful when I could not get out of bed and when I had a tube stuck down my throat and felt like I couldn't breathe all day long and yet I could look out the window and see the sun hit the buildings in Orlando and say, you know what, God, regardless of all of this, thank you for the sunset. Sometimes that pit you go through gives you an opportunity to share and help others. Have you been through a hard time in your life? God never wastes a hurt. He never does. Your greatest hurt in your life, that most painful thing, that rejection. You know, when I talked to this high school friend this week, one of the things I remembered was all the rejection I felt at my high school. All the times that I said dumb things. I know that's a surprise for many of you. Actually, now it's an asset. People are like, that's the best part of you. I think it's hilarious. When you're in high school, it is not hilarious to blurt things out. And so I remembered those things. I remember dumb things I said, dumb things that I did. And what happens? That comes to haunt you. But then you also remember, you know what? That's why it's so important to make people feel included. That's why it's so important to look for that kid who feels left out. To look for that kid that's hurting. Why? Because you learn from your past. So what have you learned from the hurt in your life? And are you using it? Because it's that hurt that you can use to counsel somebody or to help somebody. If you're, listen, don't waste it. Think about and look for opportunities for God to use that. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. By the way, verse chapter 50, Joseph's dad dies and his brothers now think, oh, now he's just been waiting for dad. The only reason he hasn't killed us is because of dad. And Joseph's looking at them like, oh, these guys never get it. He says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And then he says this. I love this. He doesn't deny the hurt from them. He says, you intended to harm me. Listen. The person that hurt you, you don't have to say that didn't hurt. You don't have to say that didn't bother me. You don't have to belittle or lessen what they've done. It's okay to say that was a horrible thing. Some of you had parents hurt you. Some of you had in-laws hurt you. Other people in your family hurt you. Some of you were attacked in places. And here's the thing. You don't have to say that wasn't a big deal. It was a big deal. Own it. But then know this. God intended it for good. Even though you were trying to hurt me, God used it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Romans 8, 28 says it very simply. This would be a great verse for you to put on your refrigerator this week. This would be a great verse to take a picture of as you're watching it right now on your, your television or on your uh, uh, phone or on your, maybe you could do a, 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 a selfie on your phone. What is it called? A uh, screenshot on your phone or on your computer. Here's the verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in a few things, that's not what it says. It says, we know that in all things, God works for the good. It doesn't say everything's good, but God can use those for the good. But here's some rules. Those who love him, do you love God? Do you have a relationship with him? If not, you can send me a note later in the week. Eric, I want to have a relationship with God. I know about him. Or Eric, I've been far from God. And, and make that new commitment, maybe just through an email this week, maybe through a text of just saying, I'm making a new commitment to love God. Those who love him, and then it says, have been called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want and expect God to bless it. But when you say, God, this horrible thing happened, I choose to forgive. Not because they deserve it, but because you gave forgiveness. I choose to release that person, not because they deserve love or forgiveness or acceptance, but I choose to. Why? Because I want things to work to your purpose. I believe Joseph did that in jail year after year. I believe he learned to forgive his brothers. And because of that, he didn't instantly kill them. Not only that, he didn't instantly reveal himself to him. Why? He was patient. He knew God's purposes over time take time. Don't get in a hurry for God to pull you out of the pit. Allow him to use it and allow him to influence you. Here's your last prayer for today. Father, help me to obey you even in the pit. I trust you to work all things together for the good. Here's the final questions for today. Are you going to be able to let go and trust God even in the worst situations of your life? Are you going to be able to forgive that person who hurt you? 
By the way, if you need help, you may need to get some counseling, somebody to help you walk through some of those things. Sometimes we need other people to walk us through, to help us to deal with it. The, the horrible situations, the unfair things in life, sometimes we need other people to help us to deal with them. But if you can do that, then can you say, God, I will trust you to work it for good. If you're watching today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, every week I want to give you an opportunity to do that. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that's talking about you and talking about me, that he gave his one and only son, Christ. That whoever believes, that's the word for faith, that's the word to trust him. Whoever says, God, I'm putting all of my life and trusting you, whoever believes in him will not perish, the Bible says, but have eternal life. One day you'll die on this earth, and the next morning or the next few minutes you'll wake up in heaven when you say, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. Maybe you're a Christian, and you've forgotten that commitment that you've made. You've forgotten that he's got you. Hey, would you take a few minutes just to say, God, I rededicate my life to you, knowing that you'll work it out for the good. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for each one watching, the over 100 that are watching already, those who will watch later this week. I pray that you would use this message to help them as they walk through the pits in life, as they help other people walk through the pits, that they would know that you're here with them. Father, that we would clearly hear your voice and your name. Lord, thank you for preserving our church. Thank you for preserving our members. Thank you for blessing those that are watching this morning. And God, thank you that just as somebody said online, you do these things because you love us. Father, in the middle of things that even hateful people do, you will use those things because you love us. You care about us. And in the middle of pain and hurt, you'll be with us. So Father, thank you for that. Father, thank you that you work in us each day. So Lord, give us the wisdom to forgive Give us the wisdom to know even how we're feeling about things sometimes. Lord, sometimes we've covered it so deep that we don't deal with it. Help us to deal with what's happened to us. But Lord, to allow you to use it in the lives of other people. I thank you for a church full of people who use their hurts to be a blessing. Who use their rejection to make other people feel accepted. Lord, may we do that all through our community and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.